The land of Israel, the land of the Bible, the land where Jesus lived, is a very, uh, is a land full of contrasts. Down east of, of Jerusalem, there's what we call the Judean wilderness. This is the picture of the Judean wilderness. This is where Jesus went when it says he was tempted in the wilderness. When I was a kid and I used to hear about the wilderness of Judea, and Jesus had gone out into the wilderness, I always thought Montana. Green, lush, but this is the desert area called the Judean wilderness, extremely dry and stark. And then we have the stories about Jesus being in Galilee. What a contrast between those two parts of the country. In the Judean wilderness is the Dead Sea, the saltiest sea in the world. But much of his ministry was centered on the Sea of Galilee, a beautiful, picturesque, green area. Of, of all of Israel, the land of Israel today, I think the Galilee is my favorite part to visit. I love other parts of Israel. I spent several weeks in Jerusalem. I loved it. It was so fine, so fun to be there. But when it comes to just being in a place that you can just sit back and enjoy the environment, really Galilee, it's all about Galilee. It's the most lovely area in all of the land of Israel. Now, the Galilee is the top about one third of the nation of Israel. You see my red line here? It's this area up here in, in, in the top part of Israel, the Galilee. It's roughly the, the, the top third and it is the richest and most fertile land in all of Israel. It's about 50 miles north and south and about 25 miles east and west. And something that I discovered in the times I've been in Israel is everything is much more compact than you think. You could drive around the whole, this whole territory of Galilee easily in a day and visit most of the sacred sites around there unless you like to visit them like I do and spend hours and hours and hours tramping around back in the hidden corners. But most people could spend one day easily and see most of the important sites in Galilee. Let me just tell you about some of the important sites. <clears throat> this is the view from Mount Carmel. An incredible view. You can look one direction and see the, the green land of the Galilee stretching out before you. Just the green lush land. And the other direction you can look and you'll see the Mediterranean Sea. It's at Mount Carmel, remember, where the prophet Elijah fought against the priests of Baal and won. It is at Mount Carmel where he built the, this huge altar and they poured water on it. Where did they get the water? There was a drought. They probably had to bring it all the way from the Mediterranean Sea. It's an incredible feat, actually, when you stop and think about it, up on the mountain. But they did it and brought it, and Elijah prevailed over the priests of, of Baal there. It's interesting, the day we were there, there were um, a, a, a large number of Pentecostal Koreans who were worshiping on the top of Mount Carmel that day. I was there for about a half an hour, and um, kind of actually, I felt bad about it but kind of had to push my way through the group of worshipers there because they were so entranced in their worship and their Pentecostal worship that they barely, barely even knew we were there. And so uh, it was a very interesting experience to watch on the top of Mount Carmel. Nearby is also another very important ancient city, the city of Megiddo. Now, Megiddo is, a, is an ancient tell where Canaanites lived, where the Israelites lived, but it also has prophetic implications. At Megiddo is an incredible water system, a cave that they carved out so that they would ha always have water in the city of Megiddo because Megiddo was a walled city, and the way they took walled cities was by siege, 
And so they wanted a water supply inside the city, and you can go down into, the, into this large water system. Archaeologists have been excavating at Megiddo for well over 100 years, and the original plan was that they were going to excavate Megiddo from top to the bottom, every layer, the whole, the whole tell. And they probably actually today have, have uh, excavated maybe 15% of the tell. But some of the excavations go very, very deep. <clears throat> One of the most fascinating places they found was this large round, they call it a bema or a high place. <clears throat> now it's way down deep into the excavations now, but when it was used, <clears throat> it, was, it was the high place and the city built up over top of it and around it. Now, this is an interesting structure. It's a very ancient structure, probably dating to about 2000 BC. And it's at this structure that the Canaanites probably held sacrifice and very likely human sacrifice, very likely the sacrifice of babies. And so it's, it's a very stark thing to see, to walk down in there. I didn't walk up on the, uh, up on the Bema because, um, well, I'm not even sure I was supposed to be down in, down in there. But it's a very stark structure to see and to think about what happened around there. From the top of the tell of Megiddo, you can see again the, the lush green fields of Galilee. And it is at Megiddo and in, at these fields that many people think a special battle will happen. It's called the Battle of Har Megiddo in Revelation, the Battle of Armageddon. Now, I don't subscribe to the idea that this is going to be to this, the, the actual site of the Battle of Armageddon, as some people do. I believe the Battle of Armageddon will be a worldwide battle, and it won't be the... Um, it won't be the Arabs against the Israelis or the Russians against someone else. It will be the people who want to follow Satan against the people who want to follow God. Uh, some people think the final battle of Armageddon will be over oil in the Middle East. I got a question for you. Why does God need oil? <laughs> I mean, does God care about oil? I don't think so. He cares about the hearts and souls of men and women. And so that's why I don't think the battle of Armageddon is about oil. It's about us. It's about men and women, whether or not we'll follow him. Another, the, the, another site in Galilee is called Tel Dan. <clears throat> now, Tel Dan is the very northern tip of Israel. It's the northern extent of Israel in ancient times and basically today. And at Tel Dan, they found this very fascinating Bronze Age gate. And if you've been with me in this lecture series for a long time, you might have heard me talk about this inscription that was found at Tel Dan. This is an inscription that talks about the house of David. It talks about a certain king who was defeated by a, a neighboring king, a Syrian king. And this king that was defeated, it says, was from the house of David. A very fascinating inscription because... Up until this point in time, <clears throat> excuse me, archaeologists, critical archaeologists and critical scholars had said, David, King David is about as historical as King Arthur. There was no King David. And yet here they found at Tel Dan this inscription that not only talks about David, but it talks about a king from the house of David. So not only is David himself confirmed, but that he had a ruling dynastic line. And this was found at Tel Dan in the Galilee. In the Galilee. <clears throat> also in Galilee is Nazareth, the hometown of Jesus. Jesus spent probably 28, 25 it depends on how we reconstruct the chronology of his life, years in Nazareth because that's where Mary and Joseph were from. And after they left Bethlehem, they went to Egypt, but then they came back to Nazareth. And so Jesus spent his boyhood 
in Nazareth. Now, the modern town of Nazareth is, prim- is basically built over the ruins of ancient Nazareth. So there aren't a lot of archaeological excavations in places where you can go see archaeology done in Nazareth. But there are a few historical places, the traditional places, I should say. Here's a church called the Church of the Annunciation. The Church of the Annunciation is built in to commemorate the coming of the angel to Mary in Luke 1, 36 through 39. It's called the Annunciation when he says to her that she's bearing that which is conceived by the Holy Spirit and she will bear a son and his name will be Jesus. And then she replies in what's called the Magnificat. This is the traditional site in Nazareth where they say that happened. Inside this church, there's actually a well that they call Mary's Well. An interesting place to visit. I don't typically give a lot of uh, credence to traditional places because um, who really knows? But it's still an interesting thing to go to a place and think about the events that happened in the life of Jesus. Now, when we were visiting Nazareth the day we were there, I found it very interesting to leave the Church of the Annunciation and walk down to the corner to catch the bus. And right next to the Church of the Annunciation, do you see the little green dome here? This is a little green dome. There is also on this street corner a a Muslim holy place. And it was interesting to look back at the Church of the Annunciation and see this banner kind of in the same view of the dome of the Church of the Annunciation. Can you see what it says? It says, and whoever seeks a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted of him. And in the hereafter, he will be one of the, lo- one of the losers. Holy Quran. Jesus is still not welcome in his old neighborhoods. I just thought this was such a stark banner to put up in front of a Christian holy place. And I got to thinking, you know, if, if we went around as Christians, if we went around and put up banners in front of Muslim holy places condemning, it, condemning Islam, well, they wouldn't be very happy about it. And I just found it strange that here in the very birthplace of, not the birthplace, but the, the hometown of Jesus, that here is, this, uh, here is this banner condemning and denouncing Christianity. You know, the old saying, a prophet is not welcome in his own country. And uh, Jesus is still not welcome because many of the people who live in Nazareth are Muslim. Uh, many Jews live in Nazareth, of course, who don't accept Jesus. And uh, most people don't realize that uh, almost all the Christians that live in Israel today are actually Arabs, Arab Christians. And so it's a very interesting place to visit and thought I would show you this picture because it was just such a a stark and in-your-face banner. Another town that most of you have never heard of because it's not in the Bible is a town called Sepphoris. Sepphoris is very close to to Nazareth. You see, on on the hills over here is the city of Nazareth. And so it's across this valley. Um, Someone estimated how long it would take to walk from Nazareth to to Sepphoris, and they estimated it at an hour and 20 minutes. I think they actually did the walk. Now, even though we've never heard of Sepphoris in the Bible, it's a very fascinating city. Sepphoris was a booming Roman city that was being built at the time of Jesus. And so think about Jesus and his father Joseph living close to a booming construction project. And Jesus' father Joseph was a carpenter or some people want to interpret that as a, as a carver of rock. Instead of working in wood, some people say he worked in rock. Well, whichever it is, think about being this close to a major town which is being built. And I have to think in my mind that since this is being built when Jesus was a little boy, that it's likely, very likely, that Joseph and Jesus, work, Jesus worked in Sepphoris, helping build things. 
And so to me, for that reason, Sepphoris is a very special place. One of the places that I will show you tonight, probably the only place I'll show you tonight that I haven't actually physically walked. Uh, Sepphoris is not on the normal track of, uh, of tourists. And so basically the only way you can get there is to get there yourself. So one of these days, and probably the next time I visit Israel, I want to visit Sepphoris. But there's something very fascinating that was found at Sepphoris. Now, this is about 20 years ago. They found a large mosaic at Sepphoris. Remember, a mosaic is a picture, usually on a floor, sometimes on a wall, but usually on a floor that is built out of tiny tessera or tile, very small, quarter of an inch, half inch, just depending on how, how minute they want to make the picture look. And uh, it's a 20, 23 feet by 40 feet, It was probably on the floor of a government official's house, most likely. 20 feet by 20 feet of it is multicolored and probably represents the the life of the Greek god of wine and revelry named Dionysius. So there's a lot of drinking and, and partying going on in the scenes. But one section of it is probably the most beautiful mosaic I've ever seen in my life. There's this beautiful woman's face and the shading is just incredible. Think about it. Each one of those little points is a little tile. And so they had to have these tile of all kinds of different colors to get the delicate shading in her face. She's been called the Mona Lisa of the Galilee. (laughs) I've seen this, 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 this particular mosaic, even though I haven't been to Sepphoris, this mosaic was taken off the floor of this uh, building in, in uh, Sepphoris and was installed in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. So I've actually had the opportunity to see this. The Mona Lisa of the Galilee. I think it's just beautiful. Well, Sepphoris was destroyed in 363 AD by an earthquake, and so that's probably why this mosaic is so well preserved. The building fell in on top of it, and it wasn't robbed out, and it was just waiting there for archaeologists to find. Undoubtedly, the most imposing feature of the area called Galilee is the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful, freshwater sea or lake it's part of if you were here on Sunday night we talked about the about the Jordan River and that water system that the Jordan River goes through in that rift valley in in the Middle East the Sea of Galilee is part of that water system and it flows the Jordan River flows into it from the north and then flows out at the south and so the Sea of Galilee flows along with the Jordan River for quite a while It's called by other names. It's called the Sea of Tiberias sometimes because there's a town called Tiberias on the sea. And so it's sometimes called the Sea of Tiberias. Sometimes it's called Gennesar or Gennesaret because up east of the Sea of Galilee, up into the hills a little bit, there's another town called Gennesaret. And so... It's called sometimes Gennesaret because of that city. In Hebrew, it's called Kenneret. And there's discussion as to whether it should be called a lake or a sea. I vote for lake because that's what it is. It's a big, big lake. But typically, we just call it the Sea of Galilee. As I say, it's, it's situated in this Jordan Rift But it's interesting that the surface of the Sea of Galilee is actually, and I told you this Sunday night if you were here, the surface of the Sea of Galilee is actually 640 feet below sea level. And that's surprising to most people. But it's 640 feet below sea level. And it reaches a maximum depth of about 150 feet. It generally covers about 40,000 acres. It's 13 miles long and eight and a half miles wide at its widest point. And Jesus spent more time in Galilee and around the Sea of Galilee than anywhere else 
in all of his ministry. And the Sea of Galilee especially seemed to be an important area for Jesus' ministry. It's on a hill overlooking the Sea of Galilee that one of the important teaching events in the life of Jesus happened. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We call these the Beatitudes. We call this section of scripture, Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And traditionally, the Sermon on the Mount is, was somewhere in the area of this church and this beautiful monastery that has been built overlooking the Sea of Galilee. It's at the northern tip. You see Tagaba here. It's somewhere around in that area right there where this church has been built to commemorate the giving of the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. It has, it has a wonderful panoramic view of the Sea of Galilee. The church is very interesting. It was built in 1937 by, the, uh, by a person that you would not think would be going around building churches. His name was Mussolini, <laughs> believe it or not, who built this beautiful church overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Now, if the Sermon on the Mount did not actually happen in this exact spot on these exact geographical square yards, it certainly happened in a place like it. And so it's nice to be on the top of this mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee and think about the things Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. And then to remember, he said this, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. And then he continues, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. You know the song, right? A wise man built his house upon the rock. Jesus says, if you listen to him and you put his words into practice, you won't fall. But if you listen to him, but you don't put his words into practice, you'll fall. And I think the principle is still very, very true today. Nearby, the, 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 uh, the uh, church of the Beatitudes, the church on the top of the mountain, you go down into the, towards the Sea of Galilee itself, there's another church at the foot of the mountain of Beatitudes, which is the traditional site of the story of the loaves and fishes. You might remember the story. Let me just remind you, Matthew 14, 16 through 21, it says, Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You have something to eat. Remember, they had been listening to Jesus all day and his disciples said, these guys are getting hungry. You better let them go in town. So Jesus says, you don't, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And the reply was, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them to me, he said, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets fulls, basket fulls, of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. An incredible event. There are, you know, there are four gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke oftentimes record the same stories. John's a very different gospel. But this story is so important. It's one of the few stories 
that are actually recorded in all four Gospels. That's very significant. It was a very significant time and a very significant thing that Jesus did, this feeding of the 5,000. And so there is a church, as there is for every event that happened in the life of Jesus, there is a church to commemorate the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. This is the church of the multiplication. It has, from the third century AD, it has remnants of a very ancient church, I should say fourth century AD, somewhere around 350. A church was built on this site and the floor is again covered with a beautiful mosaic. Uh, most of the pictures are of, of nature scenes. But my favorite part of the mosaic is right under the altar. There's a piece of bedrock that comes up they built a modern altar over it, but right in front of the altar, probably right by that bedrock, is a beautiful mosaic dating to about 350 AD. And it's a picture of the two fishes and the loaves to commemorate the multiplication of the little boy's lunch and the feeding of the 5,000. It's interesting to see that the, you see the loaves are in here, they look very much, uh, they're just round pieces of bread, very, look very much like the, like the Roman Catholic host that the Roman Catholics eat for, for the bread. And so you can see f- four loaves in here. I don't know where the other one went, but it's interesting. You see the cross on the loaf, very interesting. And then you have the two fish, and this commemorates the multiplication of all the mosaics I've seen in, in Israel and in Jordan, this is my very favorite of all time. Even though it's not the most beautiful, to me it's the most touching. To think that somewhere around here, Jesus took a little boy's lunch and fed 5,000. And to be at this spot and see this beautiful mosaic, it's a very touching thing to me. This church, we know, has been on this site since about 350 AD. It's actually spoken of by a woman named Egeria. Egeria was a Christian pilgrim who was traveling in the Holy Land, 381 to 384 AD. And she wrote a book about her travels in the Holy Land. It's called Travels to the Holy Land. And she, uh, she writes about being in this church. And so we know it's been there from ancient times. Next, I want to share with you about what I consider to be Jesus' hometown. It's Capernaum. Capernaum is on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee and says this in Matthew 4.13. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. Jesus spent a lot of time in Capernaum. Capernaum is where Peter lived, and probably James and John. It was a very important fishing village on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus spent a lot of time there. Archaeologists have been digging at Capernaum for many years, and and they found in Capernaum a wonderful synagogue. Now, this is uh, the ruined synagogue, from an aerial view, I did not take this picture, by the way, <laughs> an aerial view, and you can see it's a beautiful white, white limestone synagogue. But this synagogue has been, has been uh, dated by archaeologists to be much later, like 4th or 5th century A.D., because uh, of the, of the f- style of building and then also underneath Underneath the floor of this synagogue, when they were excavating, they found a hoard of 10,000 gold coins, and they dated to 4th or 5th century AD. And so they, they, they have dated this to much later than the time of Jesus. Now, the reason that matters is because Jesus spoke in the synagogue at Capernaum. And so we say to ourselves, can this be one of those places where we actually know Jesus physically was? Can these be one of those places where we actually know Jesus physically walked? 
And so as archaeologists have, have continued to, to excavate the synagogue, we know that this synagogue is not the exact building Jesus visited, but synagogues usually did not move. Once an area was designated for a synagogue, the next synagogue was built on the top. And so archaeologists have discovered the ruins of another synagogue under this white synagogue, and it was all made with black stone. And they date that layer to the time of Jesus. So the synagogue that Jesus preached in is on this spot, but it's just a few more feet under the surface. A very fascinating place to be. They have found in the architectural remains of Capernaum just incredible remains. Here's some, here's some grapes on one of the architectural remains. Here's a, a star. Interestingly, it's a five-star, five-pointed star, not what you might expect, a six-pointed star of David. And so this is probably not a Jewish star. But there is on a, a, a mantle that would have like gone over the door perhaps even the door of the synagogue, there is this drawing of, you recognize the symbol? It's the menorah. It's the Jewish menorah that was in the sanctuary. The seven-branched candlestick or lampstand. And so this is very obviously a sacred, was, was at a sacred Jewish place. They've also discovered uh, this very fascinating drawing. It, do you notice the wheels? It looks like a building on wheels, doesn't it? See the wheels, but you've got the, the columns coming up. And what archaeologists tell us about this, and notice also on the front, see the doors? What this is, is this was the sacred Torah scroll storage place. I should say a representation of it. So it's a picture of what they would have had in the synagogue in Capernaum, built on wheels so it could be moved, this synagogue ark where they stored the the, the Torah, the sacred Torah for the Jews. Now remember that in the Old Testament, in the most holy place, there had been another ark, the Ark of the Covenant. But when the Babylonians captured Jerusalem in about 605 BC, the, the Ark of the Covenant was lost. And so to take its place, as a special place for the Torah, they began building these Torah arcs. And we have a very fascinating representation of that here in Capernaum. Also in Capernaum, Franciscan archaeologists discovered a very fascinating building just south of the synagogue. Franciscan being Roman Catholic monks who were digging at Capernaum, did a lot of work at Capernaum. When they, can, when they were digging there at, near the, near the synagogue, they found a very interesting octagonal structure. And it's kind of three concentric circles. Can you see it? The inner circle, another circle, and then a larger circle on the outside. As they continued to excavate, they found that the central octagon had been built over a private home in the first century AD. And they identified this structure as the remains of an ancient church. And so at some point in time, it had been a private home, first century AD. They'd come and built a church on top of those remains and then built a larger church around those remains. And so the evidence is good that in about AD 50, it ceased to be used as a house and started to be used for worship. There were walls plastered on the inner inner walls of this structure and um, the, 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 the plaster has Christian graffiti scratched into the plaster. The only plaster wall they've discovered in Capernaum And they found on the walls this plaster with Christian symbols. They also found in this house fish hooks. Now, most people find it hard to believe that in the first century AD, 
we're going to talk about fishing in just a moment, but they did actually use fish hooks in the first century AD to catch fish. Very similar to what we use today. And they found in this house or in this structure remains of fish hooks. Interesting idea. Someone's home who was a fisherman whose house was turned into a church. Probably the house of Peter. And I think it's very, I'm usually a skeptic of traditional sites, but I think it's very likely that indeed this is actually Peter's house. And if it is, then it is extremely important because the, there, there were some very important things that happened at Peter's house. And so is it Peter's house? There's no way to be sure, but it, there's certainly a very ancient tradition that this was probably Peter's house. Now, unfortunately, when you go to Capernaum today, you cannot see this beautiful excavation because of this proclivity to build a church everywhere something important happened. They built a church over this site. I absolutely hate it. Can I be any stronger? Despise it. It's so wrong. It looks like a flying saucer (laughs) hovering over Peter's house. (laughs) You know? It just, it just, if you go up into the church, there are, there are uh, window, you know, it's clear floor, so you can look down on Peter's house, but it's just, just wrong. I just really hate it. But it, there, there was a very important story that happened here, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It's a story about Jesus who was at Peter's house, and the and the place is packed wall to wall. And there's a paralytic, a paralyzed man who is brought in and they want Jesus to heal him. But he has a problem. The house is so packed, there's no way to get him in. So remember what they do? They go up on top of the house, dig through the roof of the house. This is Peter's house, but Jesus is inside. They dig to the roof of the house and they lower the paralyzed guy on a bed right down in front of Jesus. (laughs) Wouldn't you like to have friends like that? I mean, this guy could have done nothing. His friends did all this for him. They lowered him down in front of Jesus. And when Jesus, it's a very interesting thing. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he's not only seeing the faith of the guy who's on the bed. He's also thinking about the faith of the four guys, his best friends who have lowered him down into the, into the room. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Interesting thing. He would think the first thing he would do when the guy came down out of the roof, the first thing he would do is say, rise, take up your bed and walk. I mean, that's what the guy was there for, everyone else thought. But Jesus could see the man's real needs. One book I like to read, it's a book called The Desire of Ages, points out that the man was probably on the bed, was probably paralyzed because of bad choices he had made in his life. Perhaps disease or something had been on, brought on by his bad choices. And so he probably, he, he had a burden of guilt in addition to being paralyzed. And Jesus looks at him and he's, he takes care of first things first. He says, man, your sins are forgiven you. And everybody gets irritated. You know, you can't do that. You can't say that. Jesus says, well, just to show you I can, he says, get up off your bed and walk. And the guy walks out. <laughs> cool, huh? But that probably happened at this spot. If this indeed is the house of Peter. Your sins are forgiven you. I love this text in 1 John 1, 9. Jesus wants all of you to know that too. And this is a text that means something to us. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and, and purify us from all unrighteousness. 
forgiving of sin was not just something that happened 2,000 years ago. It also happens today. And if you have sins in your life that need to be confessed, Jesus is still a sin-forgiving Savior. And I hope that you'll do something about that in your life if you still have sins you need to confess. Well, fishing is one of the major activities that happens on the Sea of Galilee. As a matter of fact, I should have counted before, I think four of Jesus' disciples were fishermen from the area around Capernaum. Well, yeah, Peter, I actually have it in here. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They were all fishermen when Jesus called them to be fishers of men instead of fishers of fish. In uh, Matthew 4, 18 through 22, it puts it like this. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish your people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So some of Jesus' key disciples were fishermen. And so it's fascinating to see what ancient fishing might have looked like. In a few years ago, now this is uh, from 1993, but there was a very interesting article from one of my favorite magazines, Biblical Archaeology Review, that I have, I've been getting ever since I left seminary. I have in my office here, I have uh, 30, is that right? No, I have about 40 years of, no, about 30 years of Biblical Archaeology Review on my, on my shelf in there. They did this interesting article a few years, this, back in 1993, about fishing on the Sea of Galilee. <clears throat> they told in this article that there are basically three kinds of fish that are fished for in the Sea of Galilee. One is called a barkle. I can just imagine catching that kind of fish when I was his age. Well, when I was his age, my dad and I went fishing almost every night. So I could imagine, I never caught a fish that big, but I can imagine how exciting it would have been. This is a barkle. It's a large fish, and it's primarily caught with a hook and a line. And as I said earlier on, there were fish hooks in the first century. That would feed you for a little while. But that's not the fish that was commonly fished for by the fishermen, such as the ones Jesus called. The other fish were sardines, smaller fish. You can see how small these are in, um, in the bucket there, in the tub. They're just small fish. But then the mainstay of fish was a fish called musht, most important, and it was fished for by nets. And some people call this the traditional St. Peter's fish. Because remember St. Peter, Peter was told by Jesus to go out and, and catch a fish and he found, a, um, found a, a shekel to pay the temple tax in his mouth. Do you remember that story? And so typically this fish is identified as that fish and it's probably the mainstay of fishing in the time of Jesus. Uh, so when you go to Israel and you're up by the Sea of Galilee, um, there are all these restaurants that serve this fish, St. Peter's fish. When I was there a couple years ago, even though I'm vegetarian, I thought to myself, <clears throat> I'm in Israel, I'm by the Sea of Galilee, I'm in a restaurant where they specialize in St. Peter's fish, I ought to just do it. I got in, got sat down, and realized that they, they serve them like this. I mean, they just grill them and, and uh, they scale them, but they just grill them and the eyes are still there and the fins are still there and the, the tail is still there. And when they came to me, I said, uh, I'll have the salad bar. <laughs> I 
just could not bring myself to do it. I'm sorry. I haven't eaten fish for probably 30 years. So I just couldn't do it. But it's interesting that when they have a large table of people, they always put money in one of the fish's mouth. Not everybody's mouth, but they put money in one of the fish's mouth. The guy I was sitting to, I don't know why I'm telling you this story, but the guy I was sitting next to was a Korean man and he knew how to eat fish. He ate every fin, every, every, the whole tail, and he chewed off all the skin off the head. And I'm sitting there next to him being real glad I didn't order a fish. (laughs) Don't know that I could have done that. St. Peter's fish. Now there are various ways in the time of Jesus of catching fish, particularly the St. Peter's fish. One is, one is called, there you see, could you eat that looking at you like that? I mean, he's staring at me. One of the ways of fishing for this fish is, is sane, is the sane net, S-E-I-N-E, the sane. Basically what it is, it's a huge net that the boat goes out and drops around in a circle with the, with the ropes on either end of the, of the, of the net. The bottom is, uh, has um, um, weights to push it down to the bottom. The uh, top has like something that will float. And so basically it becomes a wall in the water and the people stand on the shore. They still fish like this. They stand on the shore and they pull in the same, the same net and it gets everything in its way. Every single fish, everything that's not a fish, it, it catches everything in its way. One way of fishing, the same. It says, um, according to the article I read, it said, a good catch can bring a few hundred pounds of fish. A second way of fishing is uh, probably the one we most often think of. It's a casting net. It's a circular net, can be 20 to 25 feet across. It's tossed into the water and then falls, it has weights on the end, it falls down to the bottom and catches what is with, ever within the diameter of the net. And then you have to go down, either take the fish out by hand or gather the bottom of the, uh, of the net up and pull it up and, and see what you have caught. Um, doesn't seem to be an extremely efficient way and if the fish see it coming, they can scatter and get away. Probably the one that was used most in the time of Jesus is one that's called the trammel net. This is, a, this is fishing at night. And remember many times, Jesus' disciples, if you read the stories, they've been out fishing all night and, and the two times we hear them talk about that, they haven't caught a thing. Remember that? They haven't caught a thing. And so... This net was used to uh, push over the, the boat. It was put into the water. Again, it has a weight on the bottom. And so it kind of stands up in the water as a wall. And there were actually like three, like three layers of the net. One uh, quite, quite large, the hole's quite large, a little bit smaller and then smaller. So three layers of netting. And when the fish swam in, they could not get out. And so that's why it had to be at night. And so then in the morning, they would pull the net in and um, they would have the catch. And it seems to me most likely that this is the kind of fishing that they were talking about. You see, he's pulling the net up and you see he has the fish caught in the net. So this is most likely the one that Jesus is using when he when, um, that, that the disciples are using when Jesus is talking to them. Now there is um, something else I want to tell you about fishing, about another find, an archaeological find. In 1985 and 1986, uh, there was a severe drought in Israel and the Sea of Galilee began to recede. I told you uh, last lecture that they also pump millions of gallons of water out of the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River. So between the pumping and the drought, the Sea of Galilee receded incredibly. You can see how far out it is from the land. 
the land's kind of over, kind of where I am, on, on over to the right. Well, as a couple of guys, their names were Moshe, Moshe and Yuval Lufan, they were walking around in one certain area because no one had ever seen the Sea of Galilee, Galilee like this. And so there's lots of interesting ancient items to be found on the surface of the, of the bottom of the sea, which is now dry. As they're walking along, they notice in one particular area, one mile north of Migdal, a town on the, on the edge, of the dead, or edge of the Sea of Galilee, they noticed a few ancient coins, some ancient nails, and then they noticed a depression in in the, f- the floor of the Sea of Galilee. And it had an interesting boat shape to it. And so as they examined it, they discovered an ancient boat sunk on the Sea of Galilee. You can see the, the, actual, the actual outline now. It was the first ever found on the Sea of Galilee like this. So plans were laid to keep the discovery secret but it didn't happen. The next day, some newspaper (laughs) published uh, an article about this incredible find. And so the archeologists knew that they were gonna have to dig it up before someone came and did it illegally. And so excavation began within one week. But at this point in time, there was another problem. See all the water? The water had begun to had, had quit receding and was beginning to come back up. And so they had to do it quickly. A dike was built around it to protect them from the rising water. And for 11 days straight, 24 hours a day, they excavated this ancient boat from the floor of the Sea of Galilee. Finally, it was um, excavated. They actually had to put planking and like... Uh, bridges across, uh, cloth bridges so they could lay on it and do the excavation because they couldn't get in the boat. And so finally, they had, they had it excavated. They had carefully um, identified each little part and, and discovered that it indeed was built like a boat from the first century AD. And it's been, it's been tagged the Jesus boat even though there's no evidence, of course, that Jesus rode in this boat. But it's been called the Jesus boat. Now, the problem is that after having been underwater so long, the the water molecules or, or the water had actually invaded the wood molecules. And so instead of the wood having the consistency of wood, it had the consistency of wet cardboard. And so it was, how in the world can they move this when they even touch it, the the wood just disintegrates under their their fingers. And so what they did was they built a frame around it, trying to touch it as little as possible. And then they covered it with foam. It's a very fascinating thing that they did. They covered it with foam. They took the dike down and let the water come back in and... What happened? It just floated. Just, I think it was an ingenious idea. And so they just floated it nearby to a, to a kibbutz, which had a museum. It was only 550 feet away. And there the boat was kept in a tank for about seven years. Now, what they did was they put it in this tank so it wouldn't dry out. And as they were excavating it, I should have said they sprayed water over it consistently, continually, so it wouldn't dry out. They kept it in this tank for seven years, and they changed the solution of the tank from pure water until finally it had a solution that forced the water molecule, the water out of the molecules, and it put this resin type stuff in. And so it made the wood hard again. So after this time, they cleaned it up, and today you can go to this kibbutz, and there's actually the Jesus Boat Museum. It's a fascinating thing to see, a boat from the time of Jesus. The carbon-14 test dating dated it anywhere from 120 B.C. to A.D. 400. 
I'm sorry, to AD 40, right in the time of Jesus' life. There was a small Roman era oil lamp that was found in the boat. And so it definitely dates it to that first century AD time. The boat had had a mast, so it could be sailed, but it also had a place for oars on either side. And just um, close by, I told you, there's a town called Migdal. And there's actually a um, mosaic at Migdal that has a picture of a boat that looks very similar to the boat they actually found. So it's kind of fascinating to see the mosaic and then see the boat. Well, this one find brings to life another story that I want to share with you as we close tonight. The story of Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. It's found in Mark 4, 31, 35 through 41. It says this. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side, leaving the crowd behind They took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Spending the night with Jesus in the storm on the Sea of Galilee. They were terrified. When my kids were small, this was one of the favorite stories for worship on Friday night. We had an old blue reclining chair and we'd get the book out. My a book series called My Bible Friends that has this story in it. We'd read the story. There's a light in the room. One of the kids would be on my lap, and when the waves start going, I just gently rock in the chair. And then when the waves started going crazy, I'd rock like crazy in the chair. It's a wonder that chair survived. And my wife would turn the light on and off, and I'd go, <laughs> it was fun. You always know how it's going to end. We loved this story. The disciples say, who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. What manner of man is this? This is Jesus. What kind of man is this? It's a miraculous story. But it's not just something that's long ago and far away. I mean, it's wonderful Jesus could still a storm on a sea 2,000 years ago. But the wonderful part of the story is that he can still calm storms today that aren't on seas, but that's in our lives. That's the best part of the story. To travel with Jesus in a storm is to know that he has an answer for the storm. There can be a calm. The next day, most people read this story and don't know that the next day something happened that really reveals the meaning of this story. It's from Mark chapter five. This is right after the story of the calming of the sea. It says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. When they came to Jesus, this, blind, this devil, de- demon-possessed man and also a friend, when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. The very next day after the calming of the sea, Jesus meets a demoniac, 
And Jesus stops him in his tracks. He casts the demons out. There'd been a storm in the man's life, but Jesus stilled the storm. What an incredible story. You see, storms still happen in our lives. Bad things happen in our lives. Sometimes we get reports from the doctor that rock our world. Sometimes the death of a loved one rocks our world. Sometimes people lose their jobs, especially in this economy. It rocks our world. So many troubles and trials and storms that can come in people's lives. But when Jesus is in your life, he will help calm the storms. That's what that story is all about. He will help calm the storms. I don't know what the storms are in your life tonight. But I do know that there is someone who does know. And when you're traveling with Jesus in your boat, in your life, just remember, as a, one of my older women in my church in, in, in Mount Vernon used to say, she'd say, I'd say, how are you today? And she'd say, well, Jesus and I are doing very fine, thank you. What a wonderful way to put it. Because when you have Jesus in your life, even when there are storms and trials, he can help calm them. And I just wanted to remind you of that tonight. Let's pray as we close this part of the lecture. Dear Lord, I thank you so very much for this wonderful story that reminds us that you can help us in the trials of life. I thank you that you promise that you will never leave us and that you will never forsake us. And I claim that promise tonight for myself, but also for any person here tonight who may be going through stress and trial and trouble, and yet nobody knows it. They want to keep it to themselves. So Lord, I pray that you'd send your Holy Spirit right now here tonight to every person and help them in the way that they need to be helped. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.